Greenewalt. <laughs> Pretty good, eh? Yeah. <laughs> John. Rex, uh, I'm Charlie Collins, and today we're going to do an oral history of your lifetime. We're going to start with uh, uh, when and where you were born, and also tell you that today is September 24th, 2005. So Rex, uh, tell us your full name and where and when you were born. I was born October 5th, 1947 at uh, Plainwell Hospital. Uh, my father, Fred and Effie Greenewalt, uh, of course lived in Wayland. Uh, my dad st started the dry cleaning plant there. And, okay. And all the way as I was growing up, I was planning on taking over the family business and dry cleaning. But, uh, things happen and can't do the work, so. So tell me, Rex, uh, 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 you say your father uh, started a dry cleaning plant in Wayland? Yeah. And uh, did your mother uh, uh, yeah. help or uh, yeah, was mother. she a homemaker? Or uh, both? Yeah, I keep telling people that I was actually raised in a laundry basket, sitting <laughs> next to mom while she's pressing clothes. Uh, okay. So I. I looked up, you know, just the, the dry cleaning plant was my second home. You know? mm -hmm. Makes sense, so, doesn't it? So I lived right there and uh, we had our little player area in the, in the basement. Yep. Uh, and don't know of any other. Uh, Rex, as you, uh, in your younger years, uh, uh, before you went to school, uh, do you remember any uh, uh, interesting things that happened, a little bit out of the ordinary, that would uh, would stick in your memory. Uh, well, the, uh, we lived uh, in Wayland, in West Superior, and uh, I have two older brothers and a younger sister. But when I was a little girl that lived up the street, that was between my next older brother and my age, and we'd always play together. And for some reason or another, she'd get mad, and she'd go running home, and next thing we know, she'd be right back down there. <laughs> One time we followed her, and she didn't even make it all the way home. She'd only gone around two houses up the block, and turned around and came back. <laughs> there you go. So, but uh, we lived on the ed on the edge of town. Um, of course, this was after school actually started, but mm -hmm. I actually rode my bicycle on the expressway, 131 expressway, as they were, and of course they were building it at the time. I see. But, uh, it had, uh, you know, they built it and it stopped at Wayland for a while. Mm -hmm. And then from, from Wayland, they, it was built up to Plainwell before they opened it up again. I see. And so that, there was that long stretch that they were working on. We used to we'd watch out for the trucks, you know, heading. Out, but we'd ride our bicycle on the expressway. They took uh, the sand for the open overpasses and that sort of thing out of uh, a, pa a pasture woods area. So we played it and went over and played in the sand and that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, Sounds like a typical thing that so young people would do. Yeah, we had a yeah. we had a good time. I bet. We, we used to pick we used to pick uh, wild strawberries along the railroad tracks that ran right there, and wild mint along the road. Okay. And of course, at that time, uh, it was almost all dirt, and then and then they paved it once the highway came. There was still wild mint growing there. Rex, uh, uh, where did you start school at? I went for a very interesting thing. First classroom that I went to, in kindergarten in Wayland Union School, is actually the same classroom that I took my senior chemistry. Really? <laughs> you know, they had remodeled yeah. and remodeled and. Um, I went all the way through the Wayland, High School, Wayland School system, 
Uh, I was well, that's unique, was, isn't it? I was the uh, first first grade class in the Bessie B. Baker School when they built that. So mm -hmm. uh, went to kindergarten in the in the old school uh, that was built back in the forties. And it okay. was in the first first grade class of the Bessie B. Baker School, which went first through third. And then I went back to the old school. Rex, uh, uh, tell us, uh, do you recall much of what uh, your teachers were or what they did uh, in the early uh, grades? Uh, well, then uh, having two older brothers, and Wayland wasn't really that big of a school, right. so, and with my dad being a prominent businessman in the, in the, in the town, uh, they had a pretty good idea who Rex was before I even showed up. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed my teachers. I enjoyed school. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, <clears throat> you recall anything in grade school that was a little unique or uh, uh, different than the average uh, uh, school day? Mm, not much. Not, not much. Just, just pretty much standard. Uh, school. So as, uh, as you went uh, through grade school and, and on into high school, did you have an eighth grade graduation? No. No? Just, grade, just moved just, on into moved being a on. freshman. Being a freshman, yeah. there were, and I think there were like 12 or 14 of us that started in the same kindergarten. Mm -hmm. There were enough students that there would be two classes in each grade. Okay. At the time, we were we were kind of the baby boomers, mm -hmm. and so uh, there was enough for two classes, and there mm -hmm. were some like fourteen of us that were in every class up to high school, and of course in, yeah. in, in, high, but, school. in high school, in high school, the the required classes we were in that together too. So. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about high school. Uh, uh, any interesting things happened there? Did you do sports? Uh, I was a 100-yard low hurdler. Okay. I had last place locked. You knew how to get that last place. Yeah, huh? um, I kind of wanted to play football, but my oldest brother played football, and he got hurt. Oh, my. And my, of course, mom was well, didn't like him playing football, but she said, oh, okay, play football. And then he got hurt. And then my next older brother played football. And he got hurt. So when it came time for me to play football, there was just no oh, way yeah. that I was going to play football. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, of course, I wasn't real strong on wanting to play, but... And um, I did, I was a bowler, but they didn't have yeah. um, bowling as a high school sport at that time. Mm -hmm. Basically, I was in, in track and uh, I was in a chess club. Uh, oh, you play chess? Yeah. Not very well. Okay. I got a good, got a good training on, on chess when I was re recuperating in Okinawa after being involved. Wounded the second time. Yeah, I bet. But, uh, because uh, I was in a semi-private room with a with an officer who was a chess master. There you go. But that's yeah. that's later on down that's the road. Later on down the road. <laughs> uh, let's talk about high school graduation. Uh, did you go to the Did you go to the senior prom? I I went to both my junior prom and my senior prom, um, and the girl that I took to my senior prom, my older brother is now dating. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and they've been dating for uh, 10 years or so. Okay. It's a long day. Not, not, a, not a hurry up marriage, then. <laughs> no, 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 no. But uh, it's more of a, I think it's more of a convenience and yeah. a friendship type mm -hmm. setup, so. Rex, uh, uh, 
What year did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 1966. Okay. And I was planning on going to the Institute of Cleaners and Dyers in Baltimore, Maryland to, to, uh, to uh, follow in my dad's, take over my dad's missive. For steps. And uh, in the meantime, I got the greetings and salutations. The President of the United States decided to shaft you, I mean, draft you. <laughs> <laughs> so you went into the service. Was you? Did you? Uh, did you enlist then, or uh, I did was you? I was you, of, then you went on through the draft. I went through the draft. Okay. Uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, your early uh, experiences uh, being drafted. Uh, uh, how did that happen, and where did you go for your physicals? Um, okay. Uh, I was actually drafted in. In '67. Okay. Um, and a nice place to put this would be um, I had graduated in '66. Yes. And um, as I was working in the family business, uh, my sister got a phone call. She was on the phone for a while. And uh, she uh, turned to me and says, there's a girl on the phone that would like to talk to you. Oh, ho. Oh. So I answered the phone and uh, this, this, this Gloria Haight said that uh, her junior prom was coming up. And would I like to be her date at her junior prom? Find out that she had talked to my sister, find out if it was proper or not. <laughs> <laughs> and if she thought I might be interested or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, I agreed, yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, so we, she had an unlisted phone number. And uh, I, after the prom, I had lost your phone number. Oh, my goodness. And so basically, I, uh, uh, I didn't think too much more of it. You know, I had a good time at the prom. But, and then I was going to go to the Berlin Fair. And so I left Wayland going to the Berlin Fair, and I was on the road, and I said, I really don't want to go by myself. And I knew that she lived between, she lived in Moline. Okay. So, so sure. Right up the road between them. So I wheeled in and asked her if she wanted to go to the Berlin Fair with me, which she did. We had a good time, got her phone number again, and then she just started becoming a steady, when the fair came around, <laughs> we yeah. went to the fair. And, uh, just kept on going from there. Um, I started getting pretty serious about her, um, and then that's when I was drafted. Okay. And so I was saying, well, you know, it's hard enough with a new marriage and that sort of thing, so I didn't even ask her yet. I said, I'm just going to wait until after I go, go through basic, which I did in Fort Knox, Kentucky. There were um, two other guys from my class, uh, Bruce Smith and a um, Richardson. Um, I can't think of his first mm -hmm. name. But there were three of us from that graduated yeah. in '66 that were drafted all at the same time. Um, so you had a couple of uh, uh, buddies that uh, uh, some went people that I knew yeah, when I out, right. that I knew. Um, we all went to Allegan. Okay. Uh, uh, and there, uh, well, each one of us went to Allegan on our own. Mm -hmm. But uh, and I think that, I think there were two busloads from Allegan. Oh my! That went. So went from Allegan to Detroit, and 
uh, and in Detroit, uh, we were sworn in, and the room was completely packed. I tell you, oh, it was, my. It was yeah. hardly room to even stand. But the, you know, they wanted you to when they swore you in, they wanted you to state your name and step forward. Well, there wasn't enough room to step forward, so. <laughs> But so he just stated your name, right? Bas basically stated your yeah. minute name, and then, uh, they told you that they gave you a set of papers, and, and they said, "No, this is this is going to be your your serial number." So you got to memorize that. Mm -hmm. um, we spent spent the night in Detroit. Now, I don't remember if we got sworn in before or after, but I think it was before. And spent spent the night in a hotel in Detroit. And then was loaded on a train and taken to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. and that's that's where you took your basic and training. That's where I took my basic mm -hmm. basic training. Mm -hmm. So and what then, happened to this girl then? Well, I just I just you know basically said, uh, well wait until wait until after I take basic and then. Mm -hmm. But after basic, I was assigned to Fort Polk, Louisiana. Okay. Uh, it's infantry school, 90% yeah. of them go to Vietnam. Oh my. And so I said, uh, no, uh, we're going to have to put it on hold. So after, after my AIT, What's AIT mean? Advanced Infantry Training, okay. or advanced, indi advanced Individual Training. So okay. that's, that's when they teach you uh, a foot soldier to be a foot soldier, yeah. and a cook to be a cook, and a okay. whoever to be whoever. Um, and of course after that was a time for her senior prom, mm -hmm. which I was able to attend wearing my uniform, which, All right. which, which she loved. I bet. Um, and uh, then I went to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, for non-commissioned non officers mm -hmm. training school. Okay. And, um, Tell us a little bit about Fort Benning. Well, give you a little from Fort Knox to Fort Polk. Um, well, the two guys that I entered mm -hmm. the military with, they were in a different platoon than I was, so I hardly saw them okay. that much. Uh, then from my platoon at, at Fort Knox to Fort Polk, there were about ten of us. And of course when we got there, we were all put in, in different platoons and that sort of thing, so I didn't see them very often either. Um, and then from Fort Polk to Fort Benning, there wasn't a single guy that went with me. Okay. So, um, yeah. so then you had the opportunity to form a few new friends. Form a few, few new friends. Um, unfortunately, I was a washout in the NCO. Uh, mm -hmm. It was... It was just plain ridiculous as far as I was concerned. It was, okay. it was all, from what I could see, it was just all games. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, and I, basically, I told them that, and the next thing I knew, I was out of the unit. <laughs> and uh, I got my orders for, for Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they gave me, uh, I had, I had leave between. Yeah, after Fort Benning, you had leave before had, before you went to Vietnam. And before I had mm -hmm. to re report to Vietnam, um, so I was I was I was drafted in um, September of '67. Yes, and. Um, Going to Vietnam, um, I had to I had to report to uh, San Francisco, the Oakland, mm -hmm. Oakland, uh, and the last thing I saw the continent of the United States was fireworks over 
San Francisco Bay Bridge. Really? And was that the, uh, uh, you know, it, you know it, it, it seemed kind of ironic, you know, <laughs> uh, a war that was, mm, you know, uh, right. there wasn't a lot of oh, patriotic about it. Yeah. You know, uh, so why the fireworks? Just yeah, because your ship was going through, or no? It was Fourth of July. Fourth of July. Fourth of okay. July. <laughs> so I never, I never actually saw the Fifth of July because when we arrived in Vietnam, it was the sixth. So, <laughs> um, so, so somehow in the world you yeah, missed a day. You know, the international day <laughs> yes. line and that sort of thing. Um, we did lay over in Hawaii on the way over, mm -hmm. and of course that was great because we were confined to one wing of the of the airport. We had one small window to look out, one palm tree, and then the other wing of the airport. <laughs> 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 but uh, we traveled on a TWA. Okay. Um, but uh, there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. It was probably an older one of the fleet and uh, you know there were not a lot of amenities like you would think riding on the on your it was just basically a flight you had decent seats but yeah, yeah. Um, well see in, in times previous you would have rode a ship yeah and so well, there, there were quite a few that did yeah. go by ship but of course that lengthened their stay too yeah. so oh did it oh yeah so if you got over there, you got over there in a hurry. And so we got over there. Um, so you got over there in July of 68. And July of 68, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you arrived in Vietnam, uh, 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 what did you first see there? Um, well, the guy that was next to me, this was his second tour. Okay. And as I was, we were flying in, we were, I noticed all over the place it seemed like 55 gallon, half 55 gallon drums burning. Really? And so I asked him, ah, what's that? What, what's all these buttons? He said, that shit. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> what? <laughs> In a sanitation there, your, your outhouses had these 55-gallon drums that they partially filled with diesel fuel. And every day, you had to pull these drums out, shove a new one in, add more diesel fuel, and set them on fire for for health and sanitary reasons, and once they've been burned, then the ashes you could bury without worrying mm -hmm. about contaminating your water supply. Oh my! But you know that was kind of a kind of an interesting uh, thing. Shit! Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Something you'd never seen before. What, yeah, no. what, what did the area smell like when uh, it was burning all this stuff? To tell you the truth, I don't really remember. Okay. Um, I know that. A lot of the guys were complaining about the heat, but it didn't seem to bother me too much, and I have a feeling that's because I worked in the dry cleaning plant right. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so it, the heat it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. um, so when we first got over there, uh, we were actually placed in kind of a holding company, and mm -hmm. uh, they had projects for us, us to do, and uh, we were laying cement sidewalks. That's what I was assigned to do. Mm -hmm. you know, I got up. So they had us uh, laying sidewalks. And in one of the meetings they asked, uh, is there anybody that likes animals? And I said, I do. Next thing I knew, I was whisked off and taken to Scout Dog Training School right there in Benoit. Um, okay. And uh, I was there two days. Supposedly we were supposed to have the dogs available. 
when we came, but they hadn't arrived yet. So we had two days of kind of a book learning. Uh, this is what you're supposed to be looking for. Uh, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, then the dogs arrived. Um, my dog came from the animal shelter in Las Vegas, Nevada. And he was trained in Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. Of course, I didn't know. I knew Fort Benning had the jump school, but I, didn't, I never saw any of the dogs over there. And then I was the first handler of my dog. Now, they had, I think there were eight of us that, that trained in this class. And uh, the first day with the dogs, you just sat outside each dog's kennel. You were assigned one dog, and it was your responsibility. The first day, all you did was talk to the dog. Spent the whole day uh, so the dog got to know who you were. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the dogs were a little more aggressive than others, and so you wouldn't want to walk right into a cage <laughs> on a dog, but, you yeah, know, right. uh, the more yeah. aggressive dogs. Did you so have to feed the dogs at that time as oh, well? Yeah. You, yeah, so you did everything with the dogs that day. Once you got that dog, it was it. You, you, had to, you had to spray out their kennels. They wouldn't let the dog out, mainly because, like I said, some of them were... Uh, we're a little more aggressive. Mm -hmm. Now, scout dogs are the least aggressive of all the military dogs. Okay. There are four different types of military dogs. Most people think of uh, the army dogs as the ones that walk perimeters. They're called sentry dogs that tear up everything that they can get their teeth into. Mm -hmm. um, then there are the tracker dogs, and these are the ones that lock on the scent and yeah. follow it wherever they go. Uh, there's the water dogs, and they are the ones that were down in the Delta. We don't, I n never knew about those until just recently. Uh, and, but they detected the, the Charlie breathing through the reeds. They could mm -hmm. pick up the the breath, the smell of the breath, so that Charlie couldn't get up and put mines on the on the boats in the in the Delta. And then, of course, there were the scout dogs. Now, our job was early, silent warning. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we, you didn't want the dogs to bark at all. You, um, if they were barking, you had to go out immediately and discipline them. Um, but basically, what we did is we walked point. In other words, when a company wanted to go from point A to point B, the dog went first. I was next, and then everybody had to be 10, 15 feet behind me so that they wouldn't interfere with the dog working. Mm -hmm. And we detected caches and trip wires and ambushes and uh, anything that just wasn't normal. And they were pretty good at it, weren't they? They were very good at it. Now, um, and the dogs would only work, they only allowed the dogs to work three days at a time because this was a game with them. Mm -hmm. And after three days, the uh, dog would be a little bit tired of the game, so you'd have to go back to the rear uh, for three days. And then when your name came back on the top of the list, off you'd go with it, out with a different unit. So let's go now, back to the, uh, the first day and then the second day with your dogs and the, and the experience of, of really getting acquainted with this dog. Well, my dog's name was Schubert. And of course with my name being Rex, that was quite a joke. Uh, <laughs> and we, when we went to a report, yeah. I'm kind of jumping ahead, but um, when they, you report to a company, you know, you'd have to report in as dog team of Hubert and Rex. I'm Rex. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, 
uh, okay, and the captain's over there, so and, and they take me over there and say, dog team is Hubert and Rex. No, 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 I'm Rex. <laughs> and captain, the lieutenant, Hubert and Rex. No, I'm and sergeant. And so, and it would happen every every time. It was, but anyway. So Hubert got called Rex quite a bit. <laughs> and I got and I got called Hubert quite a bit. <laughs> Okay, so and, but so, uh, so now, now back to the now back, back to, to the, the training. training. Yeah. Um, so the first day we did nothing but sit and talk to the dog. Um, then uh, we went to just learning basic commands: sit, heal, stay. So the second day you started, started to train the dog. The dogs were already trained. Oh, okay. And the second day was training us. And you're training you to, to to handle the to handle the dogs. Okay. okay. And learn the dogs. Uh, and learn the dogs' uh, ability schedule. already. Yeah. Uh, then uh, it was about the fourth day, I think it was, when we actually started taking them out. Um, they'd have somebody go on down the trail and hide mm -hmm. and you would take your dog down the trail and watch your dog and uh, the dog would, could give you one of three different signs that there was something out there what we call alerts um, there's a scent alert which uh, each dog is an individual so you had to learn mm -hmm. your dog uh, exactly what it does because some dogs were a little more ex uh, uh, exaggerated in their movements on one thing and not as much on another or whatever. So you had to know your dogs. Um, but there would be a scent alert, which uh, you know you could tell that he's trying to smell something, and, and maybe you'd get an idea, and then you'd have to figure wind direction uh, mm -hmm. to figure out which way to, to actually look. Um, there would be a sound alert, which you'd see there ears twitch or move, sometimes they'd snap depending on, mm -hmm. and you could pretty much hone in on what direction, and of course the sight usually, with my dog, he, his head would drop a little bit, and then then you know that he was, and of course you kind of, you learn to encourage him and, and mm -hmm. keep him in mind that he has it, he was playing the game. Um, the dogs were kept on choke chains. Yes except when they're working and then they were put on a harness the, you know, the type that you've seen the yeah. one belt that goes underneath the chest and the, and once that when they're on the choke chain they know the game isn't started yet and once you put them on the harness then they know this is work time and and then you keep encouraging them what you find it what you see in what, what you got what you got there Okay, let's go. Come on. What you see? You find it? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how you would so, encourage the dog uh, to, encourage to the dog. continue to search out an search, area. Search out an area. You'd have a most of the time you'd have a direction that they'd want you to go and and uh, so and that was pretty much training. Um, so how, how many days and how long did you did you work with a dog in what you would call training? Um, I think it was two weeks. Two weeks. Um, so by the end of the two weeks, uh, you were actually one. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. whether we were or not, uh, you're you're assigned to a unit. Um, during the second week of training, um, I when. I would have what we called our first real incident. Mm -hmm. um, one of the dog handlers, he's probably stood 6'6 six, six and probably 325 pounds. Oh, wow. A big, big guy. And uh, he had a grazing wound on his arm from a South Vietnamese oh, my. encampment. They claimed they were monkey hunting, but I haven't seen any monkeys that big. So it made us very wary of 
Supposedly, yeah. supposedly the people that we were yeah. working mm -hmm. with and defending. So, um, and of course, the dogs seem to have a natural hatred for the Vietnamese. Okay. I, I don't know whether it was just their diet or what, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Vietnamese got hungry. The dog was gone. Yeah. <laughs> so after the after the two weeks of training. Then we were sent out to our different units. Mm -hmm. um, I was sent to the 25th Infantry Platoon Scout Dogs. Okay. Um, and our base was at An K. Now from there, we were divided up into squads. And my squad went to a little fire, fire base bedding up in the north. From our perimeter, we, on the horizon, we could see the Oshaw Valley. Okay. Um, the fire base itself was so small that they couldn't even drop, land a helicopter in it. Um, it's prob probably the uh, diameter of the whole thing was maybe a hundred yards. Okay. Tell me what a fire base is. Uh, fire base is where uh, they have their cannons that shoot right. out yeah. uh, supporting. Uh, the fire base Betty was actually a French outpost. So there, mm -hmm. were, there were three buildings that were French. And that's that is very, very small, and if you, when we went out, we'd either have to go outside the perimeter to get on a helicopter to go to the, to the unit, mm -hmm. or we'd have to get on a jeep and go to the neighboring fire base to get on a helicopter to... So you rode helicopters quite a bit to get to where... It's the only... Yeah. Uh, other than traveling around the base, it was helicopters. Uh, our unit in the main base, our unit had a deuce and a half and a jeep. In our fire base, we had a jeep. That was it. Okay. So your transportation, your major transportation, was by helicopter. Was by helicopter. Uh, so now you're at the fire base, and uh, uh, what? What do you do there? What's your responsibilities as far as that is concerned? Just basically taking care of your dog, mm -hmm. um, and you'd only be there three, four, five days, and you'd go back out for three days. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you'd never know who would be back. Yeah. You know, sometimes you'd go out, and they'd only need you for one day. Mm -hmm. um, they were making a move, and yeah. once they made the move, then you know. So you, were, in a sense, were on call to go basically whenever uh, uh, a uh, a unit or uh, would uh, go a company. Uh, it's, yeah. We'd go out with a company. You'd go out with a whole company, yeah. and uh, and search out the area as yeah. they were trying to advance. Yeah, either that or we would go on what they call a combat air assault. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, what that is. If they pick out a hilltop someplace, mm -hmm. and 24 to 48 hours before they bomb this hilltop, they from the ships and, and and shoot in, do as much clearing of that hilltop you could. Then they would fly a whole company in on helicopters. Now this is the way first air cab yeah. did it. And uh, of course, the company they they usually have six helicopters that they move everybody in. So they couldn't get a whole company in six helicopters. So you you'd have a first wave and a second wave and a third wave. We were always on the first wave, and we were usually the fourth helicopter in. And uh, you never knew whether it was a hot LZ or not. In other words. Is there actually 
enemy they're firing or, or what. And they figured, you know, if, you know, the first three that came in didn't receive fire, then it was safe to bring the scout dog in. Um, there, there was a reward on the scout dogs of $1,500. And considering the, the average annual income was like $200, you know, uh, oh my. at that time there was only, the only thing that I knew of that had a higher was the Cobra helicopters. And that's the Cobra gunships. Mm -hmm. So, uh, who was the reward to? The North Vietnamese? Anybody. That, anybody. That, anybody that, anybody that, you know, civilians or whatever. That, anybody that, that brought in a dead dog? No, they didn't have to bring it in. They just had to prove that they killed it or... Oh, or, my. Or, and actually the handlers, too. Mm -hmm. They found out later on that it was wiser to hit the handlers because a lot of times that uh, the dog wouldn't go to anybody else and so they'd have we'd have to shoot the dog in order to get to the handler mm -hmm. so, uh, so the dog protected the handler uh, uh, when he was wounded yeah uh, it's surprising how much the dogs get tied with you and you with the dog and it doesn't take long at all um, I had probably what would be considered one of the mildest dogs in the unit. And so they they were joking around with me and saying, you know, oh, you're, you're, you're a dog, so, you know, you're a little fairy. And so one guy grabbed, came up and grabbed a hold of me. My dog was on him, just like that. Wow. Oh. The minute he let go of me, Hubert let go of him, and everything was fine. You, you were not letting anybody I'd, mess with it you. Shocked, it, shocked, it, <laughs> you know, it shocked. It shocked me. It shocked him. Everybody was in. Whoa. Where did that come from? <laughs> uh, and they actually protected me your stuff too. I, I went see. out to a unit, and I actually tied my dog to my pack. And I had to go report to report, and uh, one of the men in the unit asked if I had something. I said, "Yeah, it's in my pack." The dog wouldn't let him near that pack until I came back and told him it was all right. <laughs> now this is not something that we trained. This right. is just something that they that that Hubert did. I don't know about the other dogs, but I tell you that that dog was something else. Well, now as you uh, as you went on into uh, the firestorms and so on, uh, uh, tell us about some of your experiences with Hubert. Um, you know, we, we did find several different times, uh, different things. Uh, uh, the big one was, you know, scout dogs cannot be trained completely to pick up all trip wires. Because if, they, if you train them to do that, they won't go into tall grass. Because there's most always a tripwire in there. Yeah, but yeah, you know, so but Hubert picked up a tripwire connected to a 250-pound bomb. Oh my! Needless to say, you know, you, uh, you get awfully attached real quick then. Um, and. Uh, When you get into a firefight, I'd have to lay on, on Hubert because he would try jumping up and catching the round. Going, really? Going past. Um, they issued me a basically sawed off M16. Uh, the, the muzzle was only <laughs> what, really? four inches, I think. Yeah and the stock collapsed inside. So I could have the whole weapon within my frame, keeping my hands a bit open to hold the leash 
for Huber mm -hmm. and keeping brush out and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the dogs had two leashes. They had a, <coughs> a, um, a um, I think it was eight foot and then a 15 foot leash depending on you know exactly what we were going. So you kept them on a leash all of the time that they were working? All the time that they, um, Jubert, I, I did, yes, because um, the conditions just sure. didn't, didn't ask for um, uh, didn't ask for anything else. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, we did, we did find caches. We did, mm -hmm. we did find. Uh, Bodies that uh, uh, we did find some graves, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, after a, after a while, the first air cab moved from the from the Highlands down to um, down to the south, just northwest of Saigon. Uh, But uh, we had to, we moved in, and again we, uh, we had to, first thing we had to do was build shelters for the dog before you even got shelters for yourself. The, really? The, dog, the dogs came first. Okay. They, they told you, you know, if, if it was a case of you eating and the dog ate, the dog ate. Uh, yeah. Your only job is to take, take care of the dog. dog. Uh, you're not to fight unless, you know, Unless it, it's necessary, you're you're protecting the dog. Uh, uh, so. so, did you have uh, some type of ability then to communicate back to the to the group that you were ahead of? Uh, um, there's usually they usually would have somebody, you know, uh, ten fifteen feet behind me where you know we could I'd stop and once I stopped, then he would come up and. And find out what I needed, or what was going on. Uh, so you just did, verbally communicated, no radios or no, uh, no, any no, particular well, hand signals next, or anything like that. Nothing in particular. You know, just, stop. just Once I stop, you know, I look, you know, I look back, and then they'd, mm -hmm. they'd come up and find out what I needed or what was going on. Uh, That's really and, interesting. Uh, and uh, I don't think the average person even. Uh, was aware of how much the dogs did in that battle yeah. and in that situation. Um, yeah. Then um, we come up. I think we're at this point where once we move to the south, we're. We were there for a while. Um, I went out with the with the unit. Now we're we're in more of a flat land mm -hmm. uh, uh, area, and uh, we were uh, going down a. A trail in the in the morning, and my dog gave me a dead scent alert. Now, basically, what a dead scent alert is is means that there was something there. It's not it's not a strong smell. You know, there, there was something there. It was something that was unusual. Mm -hmm. um, And so we stopped the column, and I says, "We got. I've got a dead sir sent off off to the left." So a couple of them went up and checked around, and they they didn't see anything. So they came back and says, "Well, uh, move up a little bit further." 
and uh, see what was. See what's going on. See if I could get a little bit better reading from my note. So we we moved up again. I, I stopped him. I got, I got a, a, a real closer thing. There's you know, something still, there. It's, it's still a dead center, but you know. Mm -hmm. And they went out and they checked it out. They didn't see a thing. I should have turned around. This is the old should have would have. But I decided that we're going to go just a little bit further and see if I can get even more accurate. And when we got up and started to move, boom. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, of course, the people behind me started firing and everything else. And then on the dog, I, I felt something hit my leg. I didn't think anything about it. You know, I thought, uh, kicked up a rock or something. So I'm laying there. I looked down, and the next thing I know, my pant leg was all red. Oh, my. And, uh, so we, they pulled us out and uh, brought in medevacs. And when we came back to a, a mash unit, there was one of the other handlers that took my dog. <laughs> the last I saw. Oh my. Would you like to take a few minutes? Sure. Yeah. Okay, Hubert went out with another handler, uh, and uh, he, he would have been re retrained with another. Yeah. He'd probably gone, but retrained with another handler. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, I had a wound just above my knee, just We're missing my kneecap. Mm. Charlie, okay. Rex, it's a real emotional time, and uh, and we we appreciate uh, uh, your feelings, and uh, uh, you know I know that you want to tell the story, so uh, we'll continue on. Okay. Um, well, I I had a, a wound that just missed my kneecap and just missed my thigh bone, uh, just went through the muscle itself. And I was, uh, the next day I was in the hospital and they brought a soldier in that was in that unit that I was in. And I, I had found out that what it was that I got was a ball from a Claymore mine, which is an anti-personnel mine made by us that had been stolen the day before from this unit. Yeah. The, and it's a command detonated. Mm -hmm. Now the cords, uh, the hundred foot cords. I see. And he had, Charlie had taken three hundred foot cords. Um, well, when I was wounded, they had, they brought in napalm and napalm this whole area in front of us as I was being evacuated out. And the soldier told me that they found Charlie with the three lengths of cord in a palm tree with binoculars. Oh, for goodness sake. Downwind from us, mm -hmm. so that there was no way that Hubert could have caught yeah. the scent of him. But he caught the scent of the bomb. He got the scent of the bomb that, that Charlie had been in the area, so he did his job. He sure did, didn't he? Um, Know exactly how long I was in the hospital and recovered, and I I don't know for sure. Um, and that's one thing about it. Yeah, you just sure. don't. Well, you know, dates and yeah, uh, time is rather time doesn't different when you're in the hospital and recovering from something. Yeah, I'm I well can, aware of that. Um, I'd like to go back just a little sure. bit. Sure. Um, 
our unit had had a record that every handler who turned 21 in the field had been killed. Oh my goodness. I turned 21 in the field. Huh. Needless to say, that day I was shaking in my boots. A little nervous. But, in a way, I kept the record because I was wounded, I was taken out of action. But it, that was, this would have been, I was born in October, and this actually happened January 31st of 69. Okay. Um, now, exactly how long it took for that wound to heal, I don't know. Um, but I was put on what they call light duty, meaning that uh, I couldn't really carry a pack or anything else. They yeah. didn't want me to do any heavy. Uh, and they, so they weren't sure what to do with me. And, yeah. uh, kind of attached to the hospital and that sort of thing. Um, and one night, I'm, I swiped my wallet with my with my light duty papers in it. And so I didn't have the light duty papers. Your infantry. Out back to the front, huh? Back to the front I went. Well there's no front in yeah. Vietnam. But That's right, there wasn't but I, I was assigned Back to, to battle. <laughs> I was I was assigned to a unit. And I don't remember exactly how long I was with that unit. Um, uh, and the morning of March 31st, we started out down a down a trail. Mm -hmm. um, we were not the lead platoon. And uh, the column stopped, and the guy in front of me, we were on the edge of a, a big clearing. And uh, the guy in front of me looked across and said, there's something over there. He stepped out in the clearing to get a better view, and Charlie opened up with an AK-47. Oh, my. The first round, I got caught in my right leg just missing my shin. And as I dropped, the second round took the back of my thigh off, just missing the tendons and the arteries and everything else. And it carried through and tore my other pant leg. It never touched that leg. So, so now you got so both legs damaged. So now I got both legs damaged. Um, and I was I was pretty well elated uh, because I knew this was it. I, I was out of there. You know, uh, they got the right leg, they got the left leg. No more legs to shoot at us in the home. Uh, <laughs> True. But uh, I, I thank God that you know, it was both of them, both of my wounds, or all three of my wounds. Uh, could have been that I didn't have any legs at all. Right. But uh, um, this was in the this was in the morning, and uh, we were pinned down, and um, a grenade landed by us, and even though you know, uh, even though I was my legs were wounded. The adrenaline and everything else. I, I, I knew that I was wounded because uh, I felt it before. Sure. I didn't know the extent of the damage, but uh, um, I got up and we ran back. Now I'm separated from the unit. Mm -hmm. I knew that the rest, because the trail had snuck, I knew that the rest of the unit was back over here someplace. No. I'm running back, and all of a sudden in my mind I'm realizing that they might think, you know, the firefight and everything, they may think Charlie's charging, you know. So I'm yelling, letting them know that, hey, you know, I'm one of you, you know. I could just see. <laughs> I tell you, you know. They are getting shot by your own uh, gun. So, needless to say, uh, it, uh, 
It was a very, very stressing time. Yes, I me. bet it was. Um, so I, I'd gotten, uh, I finally made contact with you, and, and I was really ecstatic. You know, I was, I was happy and joyous. And I, they asked me if I wanted morphine for my legs. Of course, shock had set in, and so I hadn't, I didn't feel the pain or anything, you know, and I, so I refused the morphine. It's doing pretty well. Um, and they brought medevac back in. And I was, back I was to the hospital. Back to a mash unit. Um, they cleaned me up. Um, of course, I'm still quite high and elated and everything else. They take me to the airstrip and they go to loading me on this big, huge plane. Um, now, I don't know exactly the type of plane it was. But in my mind, in my imagination, um, here's all of these soldiers wounded in stretchers, six high. My goodness. Six crossed, and probably 15 long. This huge, huge plane. Now this is an, I, I I don't yeah. know that their numbers are true, but you know in my mind. Yeah. Needless to say, here, guys with no arms, no legs. Um, oh boy. <laughs> you could hear, you know, some of them moaning and that sort of thing, and then nurses trying to get them in is maybe. You know, Needless to say, I went from my high to, to just to about as yeah. down as you can get. Right. And, and we flew from there to Tokyo. So that night I was in Tokyo. I spent the night in Tokyo. And then the next morning I was put on another plane and went to Okinawa. Okay. I spent a month and a half in Okinawa recoup yeah. recuperating from my wound. I was, uh, at that time, I was, the wards were completely full. And so I was put in officer's quarters with a captain who was the chess master that I had mentioned oh, yes. earlier. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I got to know, learn a lot of the more finesse things that, <laughs> that I, yeah. I hadn't learned before. And, uh, and uh, I was visited by an astronaut. Oh my. The yeah. only thing is, is at the time that he showed up and visited, I was so doped up and everything else that when they came in, they thought I was sleeping. And I actually sat up and I knew he was there. And I, I, I did talk to him. Yeah. But, and I remember, I can remember it, but it's, and I'm thinking it was Armstrong. Okay. But I'm not positive. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, but that was the only, all the time that I was over there, and I never caught Bob Hope or any of yeah. those. Or, but I did. I did, did meet. Catch. And I think I think, think it was Neil that, Armstrong. And, and of course, at that time, yeah. had there hadn't been that many astronauts. And right. So that was, that was a real. Big, big thing. Um, 
So, I, so now you're in the process uh, of recovering. Re recovering. In, uh, a month and a half in Okinawa. A month and a half in Okinawa. Okinawa. Uh, after that, then they figured I was well enough and, and ambulatory enough to... So you could walk at that point again? Um, with help, maybe, or...? Yeah, I... I think I was on. I think I was on crutches. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I had to be on crutches. Sure, but uh, they uh, loaded me up on a plane, and we flew to Alaska. Pulled in Alaska. I think it was three o'clock in the morning, and of course I was able to. Read and we were able to read newspapers and everything else in yeah. on it because uh, in the summertime there, you know, yeah. sun still did, light, still plenty of light, and that was that was the darkest part of the day. But yet, <laughs> yeah. So, I, but we stopped there to refuel. Uh, so I wasn't there that long, but, and at least I had a chance because of the military. I was able to visit Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> all right, <laughs> and then I when. Flew into Clark, and from Clark I was uh, immediately put on another plane and flown back to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, unfortunately, the wound in my thigh uh, didn't stay closed, and there was an infection in it. Oh my! And yeah. so uh, I was—I had spent another month and a half in Kentucky. Waiting for that heel, that wound to to, to close yeah. before they discharge me out. Um, so I was actually discharged um, uh, the the tenth of July. No, I, that would be uh, July of sixty nine. Sixty nine, yeah. So um, I didn't. I didn't actually fill my full two years, but they didn't want anything else to do with me. <laughs> I and bet so, not. And since it was from July until September, they didn't want to try putting me into a unit and then discharge, so they just discharged me right out of the service. And my parents came up to Kentucky and went back home. Okay. Uh, so uh, as you got back home, and uh, evidently your parents came to uh, to to give you a ride back. Yeah, yeah. They, they came down and picked me up. I'm sure that they were very concerned about your health and so on. Yes, that um, my mom, keep, my mom and dad said the uh, best day of their lives was when they saw yeah. me walking yeah. towards them because. The telegrams that they get, you know, says they don't give you hardly any information, and uh, even though you, you you say, you know, they were not real major wounds. You know. huh. uh, well, depends on what you call a major. Well, I still wound. have my I still have my legs and my you know yes. I still have my legs you yes. know, and, and you know and and I was able to use them. Sure. And there's so many guys that. Yeah. Um, so many of them that didn't. That's didn't, right. You can't use them. And, but uh, we got back to Grand Rapids, or back to Wayland. Um, and I had, you know, I, I had a pretty good reception there. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no big reception of any kind, but, you know. Uh, I didn't get any of the real baby killers and everything yeah. else that, that a lot of the guys had to face. And mm -hmm. since I, uh, Wayland being a small town, uh, and, and one of their prominent sons uh, being a, you know the war mm -hmm. hero, I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't see myself as a hero. You know. Right. It's. Uh, 
Well, you are. Whether you see that or not, you know. I just, like I said, I was in the wrong place at the yeah. wrong time. But, uh, well, Rex, um, now you've got one part of this story that seems to be left untold yet. I see a wedding ring on your finger, so somehow you got together with this lady again. Yeah, well, yeah. she was with them when they came down to All pick right. Up, so. Um, uh, we, we proposed, uh, uh, I think I proposed before, I'm not sure exactly when I proposed to you, to whether it was um, before, before I'd gone into mm -hmm. service or what, but, um, uh, I got home in July and We set a date. Um, I didn't. I didn't think much of the date because uh, I never was a hunter. Okay. But I was looking for a date. That, you know, I kept hearing the stories of forgetting the winter, wedding anniversary. When's your anniversary? So I wanted to pick a date that I could remember. There you go. And. November 15th happened to be a weekend, everything else, so I set it for November 15th. Okay. <laughs> and we got married in 69, and I've been married 35 years. Isn't that great? And yeah. most of that is because of her. I, 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 I tell you, she is, she's the one that did it. <laughs> Why she puts up with me as much as she does. Uh, How long have you been married? 35 years. 35 years. And That's wonderful. It looks like yeah. we'll be together until one of us. So you had a 100% disability at the time you were discharged then? No. No? It's so only 30% only disability. Really? 10% for each one of my wounds. You got to get shot 10 times to get 100%, huh? Well, I was, I was kind of lucky because a friend of the family happened to be a vet rep for the American Legion. Okay. And he immediately came over and said, you know, they may not be bothering you now, but I guarantee you they will. Let's get the paperwork in. So I got 10% for each one of my three wounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I was I'm doing fine, doing fine. Um, I realized that I couldn't take over the family business. Uh, um, one thing was working on the hard cement floors was, was sure. hard, and uh, my brother who had uh, kept the business going while I was away, um, he and his wife were kind of settled into the business, so I left and came to Grand Rapids where I could find other work. Mm -hmm. So what did you do as you uh, started working in Grand Rapids? I started out working uh, with Sporting Goods in Kmart. Okay. I did have a hard time with the rifles and, and pistols. <laughs> uh, I, I have a hard time. It's one of my problems right now. Is, uh, when I got back, uh, my wife is the oldest of nine kids. Okay. And her youngest brother was like six at the time. And uh, he came up to me with a toy pistol and pointed at me. Oops. I knocked him across the room without even thinking. Yeah. Um, I can and, understand that. Um, and uh, I had another incident where we were at a miniature golf course in front of the drive-in movie there on 28th Street. Somebody left out, let off a firecracker. The next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground. You know, yeah. then my wife didn't have a slight. She was so scared. What, what happened? What, you know. <laughs> that was unnatural. Sure. Just, mm -hmm. Boom, I was down, you know, just like that. Um, Makes sense. So, but, you know, nothing real major, you know, I was able to work. And, and, 
change jobs and change jobs and change jobs for one reason or another. And then in, in uh, 98, my health started going downhill. Mm -hmm. I was developing arthritis and, and uh, actually I started developing arthritis before that and put in because it was related to my my wound in my knee. So I got another 10% for that, which made 10 for each one of my three wounds and the 10% for the arthritis made it a total of 30%. <laughs> no, 30%, no, 30%, 30 military, the military math. They, uh, they, uh, they, 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 play, they play their yeah. games with their, with their numbers and their, everything uh -huh. else. But uh, in, in 90, er, and in 98, my dad passed away. And my health started really going downhill. I lost my job, and one of my best friends uh, died from complications of diabetes. Okay. And that was all it took. And, and uh, it put me into post-traumatic stress syndrome mm -hmm. uh, in combination with... And, uh, Uh, and they started the paperwork. It took me it took me four years to to get my disability. They, they gave me a fifty percent for post traumatic stress, uh, which brought it up to seventy percent. <laughs> Again, that's a and great they're, math. Huh? They're, they're great math, mm -hmm. um, but also unemployable and permanent. So that pays the same mm -hmm. as totally disabled. Okay. Um, so now you have a disability, so, and I'm sure that's not a that's not a great amount of money to live on. So, well, uh, it it's actually it's more than what I did, got when I was trying because sure. I never I never had a real real good job yeah. mm -hmm. um, because I never was able to really work myself yeah. up. Well, now, did you uh, have to go in for treatment for your... I, I have been to the stress, PTSD stress unit in North Chicago three different times. This is a 35-day program. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful is program. Um, you know, you meet with other vets, and it's surprising. The maybe the the actual story is different, but the similarities, mm -hmm. the feelings, the are so close to each other. And after you've gone through the unit uh, the first time. Uh, just to go back, and you, you go back there yeah. and visit, and you walk in that door, and it's so much different. You know, it's a, a safe, easy, okay. calm. calm, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know any place else. Okay. Rex, uh, uh, a question, did you ever have any children? I have three children and 14, 15 grandchildren. Wow, you're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all born well, after you came home from the, uh, yeah. from yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Rather interesting question. Uh, uh, have you ever sat and talked with your children about your experiences in Vietnam? Yeah, some, uh, some. Um, not quite in the depth that I've done here, yeah. but uh, I'm getting where I can yeah. talk about it, mainly because of the North Chicago. Sure. Um, before I'd gone through that unit, there'd been no way that I'd been able to even talk to you about this at all. Um, well, 
But people have to know what you went yeah, through. You bet. And, uh, and, uh, and that's that's why one of the reasons that I decided to do this, I'm going to sure. do this. Well, I really, Carol and I both really appreciate and admire you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're one of the great heroes. <laughs> uh, well, you, uh -huh. you and your friends uh, are fellows that make this country what it is today and for, for the ability for us people uh, to be able to live in a free country. And so uh, uh, regardless of what uh, happened uh, during and after the Vietnam War as far as the treatment of the soldiers are concerned, uh, there's not enough admiration or not enough ways for us to express how much we appreciate the fellows that, uh, that basically gave their lives and, and much of the, uh, uh, even as you did, uh, uh, became wounded a number of times uh, for, uh, for your country and for us. And so I really, really appreciate and respect you very, very much. And, and Rex, uh, we, we thank you so much for coming and talking with I us. I do like to make one, one little mm -hmm. statement. The since Iraq, the attitude towards the Vietnam vets have turned completely. Isn't really? that something? And it is, and it is 30 years in coming, yeah. but it's still appreciated, even though some of us will have a hard time actually saying. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. it's long overdue. Long overdue. But it, it, it is there. Yeah. It is there and available. Well, you want to shake hands with it? Yeah, I do. I do want to shake hands with him. See, can you kick that uh, thing out at a wide angle there so you can kind of get a shot of both of us standing here? There, yes. There we go. We'll have to edit this a little bit, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, thanks again, my friend. You're and uh, we certainly will. Uh, I remember this interview for a long time.